The universe is a bit hard to explain because it doesn't really have a clear beginning. It's like telling a story that starts at the very start, but the universe doesn't exactly have a starting point, or maybe it does, but it's complicated. Once upon a time in the ancient world, people wondered at the vast expanse of the universe above them. With no advanced telescopes or technology, they relied on keen observations of the night sky to understand the mysteries of the cosmos. Ancient civilizations such as the Egyptians and Babylonians were among the first to closely study the heavens. They observed the regular movements of celestial objects like the sun, moon and stars. Through careful tracking they developed early calendars that helped them navigate the seasons for agriculture and religious ceremonies. In those early days, the prevailing view was geocentric, the belief that the Earth stood at the center of the universe, with celestial bodies orbiting around it. This geocentric model was widely accepted and influenced the works of philosophers and astronomers for centuries. Back then, a Polish mathematician and astronomer, Nicolaus Copernicus, dared to challenge the geocentric view. In the early 16th century, Copernicus proposed a heliocentric model suggesting that the Sun, not the Earth, was at the center of the solar system. His groundbreaking work, De Revolutionibus Orbium Coelestium, set the stage for a new understanding of the cosmos. But Copernicus' heliocentric model faced resistance from both religious and scientific communities. It wasn't until the early 17th century that Johannes Kepler, a German mathematician and astronomer, provided crucial support for the heliocentric view. Kepler formulated three laws of planetary motion based on years of careful observations made by Tycho Brahe. The first law stated that planets move in elliptical orbits around the Sun, challenging the circular paths proposed by earlier models. The second law highlighted the varying speed of planets along their orbits. The third law established a mathematical relationship between a planet's distance from the Sun and its orbital period. Kepler's laws provided compelling evidence for the heliocentric model and laid the foundation for future astronomical understanding. But it wasn't until the early 17th century that Galileo Galilei, an Italian scientist, brought the universe into sharper focus. Using a telescope, he constructed to observe the moons of Jupiter, the phases of Venus, and the mountains and craters on the moon. These observations supported the heliocentric model and challenged the geocentric view. But his findings faced opposition from the Catholic Church, leading to his trial and house arrest. Despite the challenges, the heliocentric view triumphed, and over time, scientific discoveries continued to reshape our understanding of the universe. The collective efforts of these astronomers and their observations paved the way for modern astronomy, leaving an indelible mark on our perception of the cosmos. We live in an expanding universe. Every second of every day, galaxies are generally getting farther away from each other. Run the clock backward, and you quickly realize that in the past, galaxies were closer together. Run the clock back further, and there are not galaxies anymore. All the matter is too smooshed together. There's just a bunch of junk filling up the universe. Keep going, and eventually the entire universe, as big as it appears today, shrinks and shrinks to an infinitely small point. That is precisely what general relativity, our mathematical tool for understanding the evolution of the universe over these almost incomprehensible timescales tells us, that at a finite time in the past, the universe was compressed into a singularity, a point of infinite density. But nature doesn't like infinities. It's more of a mathematical concept than a reality. Physics uses math to describe things precisely, and math is great for predicting stuff, but it has its limits. When math shows a singularity, it's like a warning sign that the equations might not be worked there. Singularities are actually pretty common, at least in mathematics. If I model the force provided by a simple spring, I can use Hooke's law. The more I compress the spring, the harder it will push back on me. But if I were to compress it all the way, so that the spring was a single point, the force pushing back on me would be infinite. That seems like a dumb thing to say, but that's what Hooke's mathematics tells us. But 
You can only compress a spring just so far until some other force takes over, like, say, the electric repulsion of the atoms in the metal, preventing them from squeezing down to infinity. The singularity appears in the math, but nature knows better. Now take this example and replace Hooke's law with general relativity, and the spring with the entire universe. The universe began as a singularity, a point of infinite density and temperature. This was the birth of the cosmos, an event that initiated the grand mystery of space and time. But, understanding the universe's evolution required a journey through the difficult realms of physics, from the minuscule Planck era to the expansive epochs that shaped reality. In the Planck era, a fraction of a second after the Big Bang, the universe existed on a scale inconceivably small, the Planck length. This minuscule dimension, around 10 to the power minus 35 meters, defied our conventional understanding of space and time. As the universe expanded and cooled, it transitioned through various epochs, each marked by distinct physical forces. The four fundamental forces of nature, gravity, electromagnetism, the weak nuclear force, and the strong nuclear force, played crucial roles in shaping the universe. Gravity, the force that governs celestial bodies, becomes increasingly influential on larger scales. Electromagnetism, responsible for interactions between charged particles, gave rise to the diverse structures observed in the cosmos. The weak and strong nuclear forces operated within the atomic nucleus, influencing particle interactions and stability. As the universe expanded and cooled further, particles acquired mass through a process known as electroweak symmetry breaking. This crucial step was theorized by Peter Higgs, who proposed the existence of a field, the Higgs field, responsible for endowing particles with mass. The discovery of the Higgs boson at the Large Hadron Collider in 2012 validated this groundbreaking concept. During the Grand Unification Epoch, the three non-gravitational forces, electromagnetism, the weak nuclear force, and the strong nuclear force, were believed to be unified into a single force. This hypothetical era, occurring at extremely high energies, represents an early stage in the universe's evolution. As the universe expanded and cooled further, it underwent a phase transition, similar to water turning into ice during cooling. This transition marked a shift in the fundamental properties of the universe, leading to the separation of forces and the formation of distinct interactions. The concept of inflation was introduced to address some puzzles in cosmology. Proposed by Alan Guth and others in the 1980s, inflation suggests that the universe experienced a rapid and exponential expansion in the first moments after the Big Bang. This inflationary epoch resolved various cosmological puzzles, such as the uniformity of the cosmic microwave background radiation and the large-scale structure of the universe. General relativity provided a profound framework for understanding gravity as the curvature of space-time. In the vast cosmic ballet, massive objects like stars and galaxies warped the fabric of space-time, influencing the paths of other objects through gravity. General relativity's predictions have been confirmed through numerous experiments including the bending of light around massive objects, known as gravitational lensing, and the detection of gravitational waves, a ripple in space-time itself. In the 17th century, a scientific revolution was unfolding, and at its forefront was Sir Isaac Newton. Building on the observations of Johannes Kepler and the work of Tycho Brahe, Newton unraveled the laws governing celestial motion. The apple that fell in his orchard triggered not only the development of the law of universal gravitation, but also an understanding of the dynamics that governed the cosmos. Newton's laws provided a comprehensive framework that explained Kepler's laws of planetary motion. The force of gravity, acting between any two masses, became the unifying factor that governed both the fall of an apple and the orbit of the moon around the Earth. The idea of a universal force pulling objects towards each other transformed our understanding of the cosmos. Sir Edmund Halley, a contemporary and friend of Newton, took a step further and applied them to explain the orbits of comets. His collaboration with Newton resulted in the publication of Philosophia Naturalis Principia Mathematica, 
a monumental work that laid the foundation for classical mechanics and celestial mechanics. Halley, fascinated by the regular appearance of comets, made a bold prediction. He used Newton's laws to calculate the orbits of a comet that had appeared in 1682, and predicted its return in 1758. The comet duly appeared, as Halley had foretold, posthumously validating his calculations and cementing his place in astronomical history. Halley's predictive success extended to solar phenomena as well. He demonstrated a keen understanding of astronomy by predicting a solar eclipse, an event that occurred on May 3rd in 1715. His ability to foresee celestial events showcased the power of Newtonian mechanics in explaining and predicting the cosmos. The gravitational force not only explained celestial mechanics, but also influenced earthly phenomena, such as tides. Newton's laws allowed scientists to comprehend the dance between the Earth, Moon and Sun that caused the rise and fall of ocean tides, a phenomenon beautifully intertwined with the celestial mechanics governing the heavens. As the scientific revolution progressed, so did the capabilities of telescopes. Sir William Herschel, a German-born British astronomer, who made significant contributions to the understanding of the cosmos. His observations led to the discovery of the planet Uranus in 1781, expanding our solar system beyond the known planets of that time. Herschel's exploration extended to the stars. He catalogued and observed nebulae and star clusters, laying the groundwork for future astronomers. However, it was his sister, Caroline Herschel, who discovered several comets and became the first woman to be recognized for her contributions to astronomy. In the late 18th century, another astronomer, Charles Messier, compiled a catalogue of celestial objects that could be mistaken for comets. The Messier catalogue, consisting of 110 objects, included galaxies, nebulae, and star clusters. This catalogue served as a valuable resource for astronomers seeking to distinguish between permanent and transient celestial phenomena. Joseph Fraunhofer, a German optician and physicist, pioneered the use of spectroscopy. In the early 19th century, Fraunhofer turned his attention to the study of light. Armed with his precision-crafted prisms and diffraction gratings, he began to unravel the mysteries hidden within the rainbow of colors that sunlight could produce. Fraunhofer's experiments led him to a groundbreaking observation, one that involved passing sunlight through a narrow slit and then through a prism. As the light spread into its constituent colors, he noticed a series of dark lines interrupting the continuous spectrum. These dark lines, now famously known as Fraunhofer lines, appeared as gaps or bands amidst the vibrant colors of the spectrum. Each of these dark lines represented the absence of specific wavelengths of light. Fraunhofer carefully catalogued and mapped these lines, assigning them letters like A, B, C, and so on. These spectral lines, unique to each element, served as a celestial fingerprint, allowing scientists to identify the composition of distant stars and galaxies. Fraunhofer's observations extended beyond the dark lines. He also identified bright bands in the spectrum. These bright bands, or absorption lines, corresponded to wavelengths of light that were absorbed by atoms in the outer layers of stars. By studying these lines, astronomers could decipher the chemical composition of celestial bodies. One of the most notable contributions of Fraunhofer was the discovery of the solar sodium doublet. Two closely spaced dark lines in the solar spectrum corresponding to sodium absorption. This finding marked a significant milestone in the understanding of both terrestrial and celestial chemistry. Meanwhile, Heinrich Olbers, a German astronomer, pondered a paradox known as Olber's paradox. If the universe were infinite and static, with stars distributed uniformly, the night sky should be ablaze with light. Yet the sky was dark. Olber speculated that the universe might not be infinite, or that there could be an unknown factor limiting the visibility of distant stars. Friedrich Bessel, a German astronomer and mathematician, contributed significantly to the field of astronomy in the early 19th century. His observations of the star 61 Cygni led to the first accurate measurement of the distance to a star through stellar parallax. This groundbreaking achievement laid the groundwork for determining the vast distances between stars in our galaxy. 
In the realm of theoretical physics, one name stands out among the luminaries of the 20th century, Paul Adrian Maurice Dirac. Born in Bristol, England in 1902, Dirac's mind was a beacon of mathematical brilliance that would eventually illuminate the mysterious world of antimatter. Dirac's journey into the unknown began at the University of Cambridge where he delved into quantum mechanics under the guidance of renowned physicists like Ralph Fowler and Paul Dirac's own cousin, Eugene Wigner. His fascination with the mathematical elegance of quantum mechanics led him to formulate the Dirac equation, which described the behavior of electrons in accordance with both quantum mechanics and special relativity. It was during the solution of this equation in 1928 that Dirac stumbled upon a radical prediction, one that seemed too extraordinary to be true. The equation suggested the existence of antiparticles, particles with the same mass as electrons, but opposite charge. This revelation was groundbreaking and hinted at a realm beyond the known universe, a mirror world composed of antimatter. In 1932, the experimental verification of Dirac's prediction came to fruition. The American physicist Carl Anderson, while studying cosmic rays, discovered the first antimatter particle, the positron, an antiparticle counterpart to the electron. Dirac's accidental discovery of antimatter had become a tangible reality. The existence of antimatter brought forth a new perspective on the nature of the universe. Matter and antimatter, when they meet, annihilate each other in a burst of energy, leaving only photons behind. This process, known as antimatter annihilation, is a fundamental aspect of the universe, shaping its dynamics on both cosmic and quantum scales. As the understanding of particle physics advanced, scientists recognized the importance of four fundamental forces in the universe, gravity, electromagnetism, the weak nuclear force, and the strong nuclear force. Each of these forces played a crucial role in shaping the interactions between particles and the structure of the cosmos. In the high energy environments of the early universe, Scientists believe that matter and antimatter were created in equal amounts during the Big Bang. However, the apparent dominance of matter in the observable universe raises a perplexing question. What happened to the antimatter? One hypothesis suggests that there might be subtle differences in the behavior of matter and antimatter, leading to a slight imbalance that allowed matter to prevail. The exploration of particle physics took an exciting turn with the study of quarks, the fundamental constituents of protons and neutrons. In high-energy experiments, scientists created conditions resembling the early moments of the universe, resulting in a state known as the quark-gluon plasma, a hot, dense soup of quarks and gluons. This quark-gluon plasma provided perception into the behavior of matter under extreme conditions resembling the state of the universe microseconds after the Big Bang. The exploration of such exotic states of matter not only deepened our understanding of the early universe, but also revealed the complex dance of particles governed by the strong nuclear force. As the quest for knowledge continued, scientists turned their attention to neutrinos, ghostly particles that interact weakly with matter. Initially thought to be massless, experiments later revealed that neutrinos do possess a small but non-zero mass. This discovery challenged existing models and fueled new avenues of research in particle physics and astrophysics. The study of neutrinos extended beyond particle physics laboratories to the cosmos itself. Neutrinos generated in the core of the sun provided a unique window into the solar interior offering valuable intuition into the processes driving the sun's energy production. The brilliant minds like Dirac, along with the collective efforts of physicists around the world, contribute to the ever-expanding complexity of human knowledge about the fundamental building blocks of the universe. The telescope, the spectrometer and the photograph opened up the cosmos before us, but it was a cosmic Pandora's box. We struggled and grasped to connect the physics we were learning on the earth electricity and magnetism, heat and energy, chemistry and the element, and other hot topics of the day, to the scales of the heavens and we failed terribly. 
It was becoming painfully obvious that the cosmos was not connected to us, did not care about us, and did not care for us. We were an ant climbing on a branch of a vast tree that was incomprehensibly larger and more complex than we ever thought. We were reaching out with our enhanced senses and the powerful tool of the scientific method, and we were not liking what we were seeing. The quest to measure cosmic distances and understand the scale of the universe has been an enduring challenge. It begins in the 17th century, when astronomers grappled with the idea that stars might not be fixed points of light, but distant suns. The shift in perspective was revolutionary, but the question remained, how far away were these celestial bodies? Parallax, the apparent shift in the position of a star when observed from different vantage points. The concept was introduced by the ancient Greeks, but it wasn't until the 19th century that astronomers devised a method to measure it. Friedrich Bessel, a German astronomer, became the pioneer in this endeavor. In 1838, Bessel successfully measured the parallax of the star 61 Cygni, marking the first time the distance to a star beyond our solar system was determined. The principle of parallax relies on Earth's orbit around the Sun. As our planet completes its yearly journey, the position of a nearby star appears to shift against the distant cosmic background. By precisely measuring this apparent movement, astronomers can calculate the distance to the star. Building on the foundation laid by Bessel, the American astronomer Williamina Fleming and her colleague Annie Jump Cannon played crucial roles in the early 20th century. They studied photographic plates of the night sky, identifying and classifying thousands of stars. Among these stellar objects were the Cepheid variable stars, stars that fluctuate in brightness over a predictable period. The Cepheid variable stars would soon become cosmic yardsticks for measuring astronomical distances. Henrietta Swan Leavitt, a brilliant astronomer working at the Harvard College Observatory, made a remarkable discovery, a relationship between the period of variability of Cepheid stars and their luminosity. This groundbreaking insight provided astronomers with a standard candle, a means to gauge the distance to these stars. Leavitt's discovery proved invaluable when Edwin Hubble, an American astronomer, embarked on a quest to determine the distances to galaxies beyond our Milky Way. Hubble utilized the Cepheid variables to measure the distances to the Andromeda galaxy and other galaxies, revealing that these cosmic island universes existed far beyond the confines of our own. In the 1920s, Hubble made another groundbreaking observation. He noted a correlation between the redshift of light from galaxies and their distance, now known as Hubble's law. The redshift, caused by the stretching of light waves as the universe expands, indicated that galaxies were moving away from each other, suggesting an expanding universe. Hubble's observations helped for the development of the Big Bang Theory, a concept coined by British astrophysicist Fred Hoyle's initial skepticism. Hoyle preferred the steady-state theory, suggesting a universe that maintained a constant density as new matter continuously formed. But the evidence supporting the expanding universe and the remnant radiation from the early universe, known as Cosmic Microwave Background, CMB, became undeniable. The story of CMB harks back to the year 1965, with Anna Penzias and Robert Wilson, two Bell Labs researchers who discovered a mysterious static hiss in their radio antenna. The source of this interference turned out to be the afterglow of the Big Bang, the cosmic microwave background radiation. This accidental discovery solidified the Big Bang theory and remains one of the most significant breakthroughs in the field of astrophysics. So far in our tale, we have been following two threads. One has been about humanity's general confusion when it comes to the goings-on of the night sky, and our attempts, usually feeble, but occasionally breathtaking in scope, to measure and understand what's going on up there. The other thread has been a biography of the universe itself as we currently don't understand it, starting in the black box of the Planck Epoch and proceeding through the splitting of the forces, the incredible dynamics of inflation, and the rise of matter over antimatter. In the timeline of our more recent history, the expansion of the universe had just been uncovered, 
and in the coming decades, debates would swell over how best to interpret Hubble's stunning results. But in the 1960s, a key observation would be made, a simple collection of data that cemented our modern picture of the grand history of our universe, the Big Bang model. In the early 20th century, a scientific revolution was underway. At the forefront of this revolution was the German physicist Max Planck, whose groundbreaking work on spectral lines and the black body problem laid the foundation for quantum theory. Max Planck's journey into the quantum realm began with the study of black body radiation, an object that absorbs and emits all frequencies of electromagnetic radiation. Classical physics struggled to explain the observed spectrum of black body radiation, known as the ultraviolet catastrophe. In an attempt to address this puzzle, Planck introduced a revolutionary idea in 1900. Planck proposed that electromagnetic radiation is quantized, meaning energy is emitted or absorbed in discrete units called quanta. This quantization expressed in his famous equation, E equal HF successfully explained the observed black body spectrum. This concept marked the birth of quantum theory, challenging the classical understanding of continuous energy emission. In the years that followed, quantum theory evolved, and physicists Otto Stern and Walther Gerlach made significant contributions with their groundbreaking experiment in 1922. This concept marked the birth of quantum theory, challenging the classical understanding of continuous energy emission. In the years that followed, quantum theory evolved, and physicists Otto Stern and Walther Gerlach made significant contributions with their groundbreaking experiment in 1922. The Stern-Gerlach experiment revealed the quantization of angular momentum, highlighting the inherent quantized nature of particles' intrinsic spin. This experiment provided crucial understanding into the fundamental nature of particles and set the stage for the classification of particles into two broad categories, fermions and bosons. Fermions, such as electrons, protons and neutrons, obey the Pauli exclusion principle, which prohibits two identical fermions from occupying the same quantum state simultaneously. Bosons, on the other hand, follow different statistical rules and include particles like photons and gluons. As the understanding of quantum theory deepened, the exploration of particle physics extended to the discovery of muons, a heavier cousin of electrons. Muons, initially puzzling to physicists, became an interesting component of the subatomic world. The early universe, a hot and dense cauldron of particles and energy, underwent remarkable transformations. At extremely high temperatures, particles behaved differently, and the distinction between electric and magnetic fields blurred. The unified electromagnetic force acted as a single entity, showcasing the unification of forces at these extreme conditions. The exploration of the early universe's electric and magnetic fields provided insights into the grand unification of forces, an ambitious theory aiming to unify electromagnetism, the weak nuclear force, and the strong nuclear force into a single comprehensive framework. While not fully realized yet, the pursuit of this grand unification continues to captivate the imaginations of physicists. Our universe was born in mystery, but that doesn't mean that puzzling specters don't still haunt the modern day cosmos. By the 1960s, we had firmly established both the Big Bang and beginnings of the Standard Model. We knew the universe both inside and out. That would perhaps be the last time we would feel so assured in our knowledge. A few hundred thousand years in, our universe needed a little unsettling. After the release of what would become the cosmic microwave background, the light was free, the universe quickly became dark. With the inevitable cosmic expansion that dictates so much of the physics of this story, the light that once so brilliantly flooded the universe shifted down from the intense, white-hot energy of its initial release to a smoldering red, eventually slipping out of the visible altogether. For the first time in its exotic, strange journey, the universe experienced true coldness. As the universe celebrated its one millionth birthday, it was practically geriatric. Nothing substantial or worthy of note had happened to it since the flash of recombination. No radical phase transitions. No battles between competing forces. Matter had finally dominated over all other forms of energy density. It was now the big cheese in the universe, but it inherited a bleak, featureless landscape. 
In the Cosmic Symphony of Creation, a key chapter unfolds with the groundbreaking work of Alan Guth and the theory of cosmic inflation. Born out of the quest to solve certain mysteries of the early universe, inflation proposes a period of exponential expansion, providing elegant solutions to various cosmological puzzles. Alan Guth's journey began in the 1970s, when he sought to address certain anomalies in the standard Big Bang model, such as the uniformity of the cosmic microwave background radiation, and the large-scale structure of the universe. Guth's proposed inflationary model suggested that the universe underwent a rapid expansion, smoothing out irregularities and setting the stage for the vast cosmic structures we observe today. During the inflationary epoch, the universe expanded exponentially, driven by a hypothetical field called the inflaton. This expansion stretched and flattened the fabric of space-time, leaving a lasting imprint on the universe's large-scale structure. It also introduced the concept of vacuum energy, a form of potential energy associated with the vacuum of space itself. As the universe expanded and cooled, the vacuum energy manifested as density fluctuations, providing the seeds for the formation of cosmic structures. One of the significant consequences of this inflationary period was the creation of primordial density perturbations, tiny variations in density that served as the cosmic blueprints for the formation of galaxies, stars, and ultimately, the universe. The first stars emerged from these primordial density perturbations as gravity gathered matter into dense pockets within the vast cosmic web. These early stars, composed primarily of hydrogen and helium, ignited the cosmic dawn, a celestial spectacle that pierced the darkness of the early universe. The birth of these stars marked a transformative era, as their intense radiation altered the state of the surrounding space, ionizing hydrogen atoms and illuminating the cosmic canvas. The population of the first stars, often referred to as Population 3 stars, represented a departure from the metal-rich stars that would follow in later cosmic epochs. These population three stars lacked elements heavier than helium, as those heavier elements were synthesized through nuclear processes within their cores and later dispersed into space through stellar explosions. As these early stars exhausted their nuclear fuel, they ended their lives in spectacular supernova explosions, enriching the interstellar medium with heavy elements. The remnants of these explosions seeded the formation of second-generation stars, known as Population 2 stars, which possessed trace amounts of heavier elements inherited from their progenitors. Over time, the universe continued its dynamic evolution, giving rise to a myriad of structures, galaxies, vast cosmic islands composed of stars, gas, and dark matter, emerged as gravity continued to sculpt the fabric of space-time. These galaxies became the cosmic playgrounds where stars interacted, coalesced, and shaped the destiny of their cosmic homes. In the heart of some galaxies, under the gravitational influence of vast cosmic structures, the first black holes formed, born from the remnants of massive stars that had exhausted their nuclear fuel. These primordial black holes grew in size as they consumed surrounding matter. The centers of galaxies hosted supermassive black holes, their immense gravitational pull shaping the dynamics of the galactic environment. Compare yourself at 10 years old and 20 years old. Chances are you are a radically different person. Compare yourself at 20 versus 30. You're probably a little rounder around the middle, but otherwise unchanged. That's what puberty does. It transforms you from a kid into a proto-adult. The epoch of reionization was when the universe finally grew up. Done with the days of wild phase transitions and late night plasma parties. In where the days of mortgage payments and bad backs, in the dark ages, the universe was threaded with a dense, warm soup of neutral gas. If you could transport yourself there, it would look totally unfamiliar and alien, as strange as any of the earlier epochs. After the cosmic dawn and ionization, the universe looked like the universe. Vast, dark, transparent, and dotted with galaxies swirling, with billions of glittering stars. Much like you, since your 20th birthday, it hasn't physically changed much since then, at least in comparison to younger days. After a billion years, after the last of the neutral gas had been swept away, and left to cower 
in small pockets inside galaxies. After the cosmos had once again been filled with light and heat and warmth, the greatest structure in the universe began to coalesce. In the mid-20th century, a Swiss astronomer Fritz Zwicky turned his gaze toward the coma cluster, an assemblage of galaxies located some 320 million light years away. Little did he know that his observations would lead to a profound revelation about the invisible cosmic enigma we now call dark matter. Fritz Zwicky, known for his sharp intellect and often brash demeanor, studied the galaxies within the coma cluster in the 1930s. His observations revealed that the visible mass, stars, gas, and dust, was insufficient to account for the gravitational forces holding the cluster together. The calculated mass, based on visible matter, fell dramatically short of what was needed to prevent the galaxies from flying apart. Confronted with this discrepancy, Zwicky postulated the existence of an unseen massive component that he referred to as dunkel matter or dark matter. Although his proposal garnered attention, it faced skepticism from some quarters within the scientific community. The concept of dark matter would linger in the cosmic shadows for several decades until the work of American astronomer Vera Rubin brought it back into the scientific spotlight. In the 1960s and 1970s, Vera Rubin observed the rotation curves of spiral galaxies, a measure of the rotational speed of stars at different distances from the galactic center. Contrary to expectations based on visible matter alone, the stars at the outer edges of galaxies were moving at surprisingly high speeds. According to the laws of gravity, this implied that additional mass, not accounted for by visible matter, was contributing to the gravitational pull holding galaxies together. Rubin's groundbreaking work provided strong evidence for the presence of dark matter on galactic scales, supporting and extending Zwicky's earlier hypothesis. The realization that dark matter was not an anomaly limited to individual clusters, but permeated throughout the cosmos, sparked a new era of inquiry into the nature of this mysterious substance. As astronomers delved deeper into the study of dark matter, alternative explanations and theories emerged. One such theory was MOND, Modified Newtonian Dynamics, proposed by Mordechai Milgram in the 1980s. Mond suggested that gravitational forces behave differently at low accelerations, offering an alternative explanation for the observed galactic dynamics without the need for dark matter. However, Mond faced challenges in explaining observations on larger cosmic scales. The quest for the nature of dark matter extended beyond astronomical observations and theoretical proposals. Scientists began searching for dark matter particles, hypothesized to be weakly interacting massive particles, WIMPs. Experiments aimed at detecting these elusive particles were conducted deep underground and in space. But as of now, direct detection of dark matter remains an ongoing challenge. Stars and even galaxies are lighthouses on a distant, hidden shore. A beacon of light signaling the presence of larger masses, tracing their outlines without revealing more. The journey started by Zwicky and Rubin, and continuing to the present day, leads us to an inescapable and uncomfortable conclusion. We do indeed live in a dark, cold universe. In the vast cosmic expanse, a delicate web of structure weaves through the darkness, a network known as the cosmic web. These mysterious filaments, knots, and voids serves as the backbone of the universe, connecting galaxies in a dance of cosmic proportions. The story begins with the Voyager 1 spacecraft, humanity's emissary, venturing beyond our solar system. Launched in 1977, Voyager 1 embarked on a journey through the realms of our outer planets, capturing iconic images of Jupiter and Saturn. However, its mission extended beyond the boundaries of our celestial neighborhood. As Voyager 1 continued its trajectory, it carried with it the curiosity of humanity and the desire to explore the far reaches of space. In 1990, when Voyager 1 was nearly 4 billion miles away from Earth, astronomer Carl Sagan requested the spacecraft to turn its camera back and capture a poignant image, a pale blue dot. In this photograph, Earth appeared as a tiny speck, a reminder of our fragile existence in the vastness of the cosmos. While Voyager 1 sailed toward the edge of our solar system, astronomers on Earth delved into the cosmic architecture that extends far beyond the reach of our most powerful telescopes. One of the awe-inspiring structures revealed by astronomers is the Great Wall, 
a colossal cosmic structure stretching across hundreds of millions of light years. This vast assemblage of galaxies, interconnected by the gravitational forces that govern the universe, stands as a testament to the colossal scale of cosmic structures. The Great Wall is part of a larger conglomeration known as the Sloan Great Wall, discovered in the late 1980s by astronomers utilizing data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. This immense structure is just one thread in the large cosmic web, a sprawling network of filaments and voids that spans the observable universe. As astronomers continued their exploration, they encountered an enigmatic cosmic force known as the Great Attractor, an immense concentration of mass that influences the motion of galaxies, including the Milky Way. Beyond the Great Attractor lies the shapely supercluster, an even larger structure that encompasses thousands of galaxies and dominates a vast cosmic neighborhood. Within these cosmic structures, our own galaxy, the Milky Way, belongs to a smaller community known as the Local Group. This grouping includes the Andromeda Galaxy, the Triangulum Galaxy, and numerous smaller galaxies, all bound together by their gravitational interactions. The Local Group is but a minuscule part of the Grand Cosmic Symphony, nestled within the expansive reaches of the cosmic web. But the expansion is inevitable, and it's getting worse. Galaxies are still in motion, set off by gravitational interactions, initiated in the distant past. But that motion is slowly grinding to a halt. Five billion years later, the engines of creation shut down. The local group will never reach the Virgo cluster. The Virgo supercluster will never reach Norma. Leniakia will never fully condense and eventually it will be ripped apart. In a few tens of billions of years, the cosmic web, with its beautiful, intricate lacework of filaments, walls and knots, the largest pattern found in nature, will be gone. In the vast cosmic theatre, one of the most captivating performances is the birth of stars. Our very own star, the Sun, emerged from the cosmic womb in a ballet of interstellar gas and dust, shaped by the gravitational forces that govern the cosmos. The story begins in a region of our Milky Way, galaxy enriched with cosmic ingredients, primordial hydrogen, helium, and traces of other elements. Within this molecular cloud, gravity initiated a delicate dance, gradually pulling together pockets of gas and dust. As these pockets collapsed under their own gravitational pull, they formed dense cores, heralding the birth of stars. The study of stars and their characteristics took a giant leap forward in the early 20th century thanks to the pioneering work of astronomers Hertzsprung and Russell. Their collaboration would give rise to a visual masterpiece, the Hertzsprung-Russell HR diagram. They independently created the HR diagram in the early 20th century. The diagram became a celestial canvas, showing the relationship between a star's luminosity and its temperature. Hertzsprung, in 1905, observed that the absolute magnitudes of stars, a measure of their intrinsic brightness, correlated with their color, an indicator of temperature. Russell, working independently in 1913, reached a similar conclusion. Combining their findings, they presented the HR diagram in 1914. The HR diagram presented a stunning visual representation of stellar properties. Stars on the diagram fell into distinct regions, revealing evolutionary trends and allowing astronomers to classify stars based on their life stages. The main sequence where stars spend the majority of their lives ran diagonally across the diagram. This sequence became a stellar highway guiding astronomers through the life cycle of stars. Observing the HR diagram, astronomers witnessed the diverse trajectories that stars could take. From the humble dwarfs to the luminous giants, the diagram became a cosmic atlas, mapping out the vast realm of stellar diversity. As the HR diagram unfolded, it revealed the secrets of the cosmos, enabling astronomers to decipher the characteristics of stars, understand their life cycles, and explore the dynamics of stellar evolution. The diagram became an indispensable tool in the celestial toolkit, guiding astronomers on their quest to unravel the mysteries of the universe. Within and even around galaxies, hydrogen finds ways to clump together, to form stars, to fuse to heavy elements, spread back out and repeat the story. Repeat this process ad nauseum across the universe and voila, a cosmos full of stars, galaxies, light and vitality.
A universe happily churning out generation after generation of stars, each galaxy a factory, inundating the cosmos with light and warmth. For the billions of years since the awakening of the cosmic dawn, we live in the stelliferous era, the star-forming and star-loving age of cosmic evolution. An age when elements are fused and the star nebula cycles continue for generation after generation. An age when life can establish footholds on planetary surfaces and find nourishment for billions of years. In the cosmic shore, the sun, like all stars, is destined to follow a predetermined script, a life cycle that spans billions of years. As the eons unfold, the fate of the sun and its celestial companions will be inexorably shaped by the laws of astrophysics. The sun, currently in the throes of middle age, is a stable hydrogen-fueled furnace at its core. But, as the nuclear fusion reactions continue over the next few billion years, the sun will exhaust its hydrogen fuel, initiating a cosmic metamorphosis. Around 5 billion years from now, the sun will enter a phase known as the red giant phase. As the nuclear furnace in its core dwindles, the outer layers of the sun will expand outward, engulfing the inner planets, including Earth. The once humble sun will transform into a bloated, fiery behemoth, a red giant with a diameter that could extend beyond Earth's current orbit. During this colossal transformation, Earth's fate is intricately entwined with the sun's evolution. As the sun expands, its outer layers will interact with Earth's atmosphere, causing it to gradually lose mass. The increased solar luminosity will lead to a rise in temperatures on Earth, rendering the surface inhospitable for life as we know it. While the red giant phase may signal the end of habitability on Earth, it's not the final act for the sun. The outer layers will be expelled into space, creating a mesmerizing display known as a planetary nebula. What remains of the sun's core will contract, forming a white dwarf, a dense, earth-sized remnant that will gradually cool over trillions of years. As the sun's glow diminishes, Earth's core will also undergo changes. The cooling process of our planet's core is a gradual one. Over eons, the molten iron-nickel core will solidify further, leading to a reduction in the strength of Earth's magnetic field. Eventually, the magnetic shield that protects our planet from solar winds and cosmic radiation will weaken, exposing the surface to harsh space conditions. The fate of the universe is an expansive narrative and as our local celestial entities experience their final acts, the broader cosmos continues its own evolution. The universe's fate is entangled with concepts like dark energy and dark matter, both of which play mysterious roles in cosmic dynamics. In the distant future, the universe may enter a phase known as the degenerate era. Stars will exhaust their nuclear fuel, and stellar remnants like white dwarfs and neutron stars will populate the cosmos. Over even longer timescales, black holes will evaporate through Hawking radiation, contributing to the gradual dimming of the cosmic stage. As time marches on, proton decay, a hypothetical process in which protons, the building blocks of atomic nuclei, decay into lighter particles, may become a reality. This marks another epoch in the cosmic saga, leading to the disintegration of matter, Ultimately, the universe might face a phenomenon known as heat death. In this scenario, all energy gradients in the cosmos would be exhausted, resulting in a state of maximum entropy, an equilibrium where no further processes can unfold. The universe, once full of billions of galaxies, stars and planets, would become a silent and dark again.